Uh, good morning, dear uh, family and friends all over the Philippines and uh, to our friends and family in other countries like the U.S., uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, those that are in Italy, Thailand, and many other nations that will be listening in uh, today as we go live and through YouTube later on uh, when you have vacant times. Well, anyway, uh, it's raining right now in Baguio. So, uh, praise God for the rain. It's been in a drought condition for many months. And uh, in the lowlands, they have not been able to plant rice. But with the rains, here comes the new planting season rain was a symbol is a symbol of the holy spirit and uh, we used to sing that rain is like the holy spirit as it comes into our hearts and i pray that the holy spirit will pour out his blessings upon each of you wherever you are we will continue today on our lessons about biblical counseling and last thursday we were talking about iniquity uh, iniquity is the sin nature of man uh, we often believe that we are who our parents were or like father like son or we often say you are a product of your past which is true many times okay uh, we learned last time and this is just for review that iniquity is the lawless lawlessness of the spirit uh, if you are born again meaning you are born in the spirit of god then your spirit obeys the law of god otherwise your spirit is in a state of lawlessness and when there is lawlessness that is what we call iniquity okay and the next one is uh, if there is iniquity in your heart uh, there is a state of evil desire uh, it's innate in your spirit that you want to uh, do what your heart desires okay and then the third about iniquity when you have a tendency or a desire to commit iniquity or do iniquity so uh, all of us we are born in sin and therefore um, the sin nature in man will continue generation after generation a father to son son to uh, the next generation if it is not uh, changed by the power of the blood of Jesus. The second thing that we should remember about iniquity is that it comes through the family bloodline. Okay, so sin nature comes through the family bloodline also. Uh, that is why, again, we say that you are like your father or you are born like your father. Uh, that can be good and it can be bad. If your father was a sinner, then you have a tendency to also sin like your father did. Okay. That is what we call in uh, biblical terms Adamic nature. The Adamic nature of man is 
to follow what comes through the bloodline, family bloodline. Number three, as we review this morning, there are specific sins and patterns of sin that go from generation to generation. Especially patterns. Uh, every son or daughter inherits a pattern of sin in the father or in the mother. So that even among the Jews, they were very careful to trace their lineage. So you will see in Matthew chapter 1, the lineage of Jesus. And you will see that uh, this person begat another person and so on and so on. And it will show you if he is really part of the household of Israel, they will trace his lineage up to Jacob. Okay, or even further up to Abraham. Well, anyway, uh, this is very important when you are dealing with, uh, you are counseling with people that have patterns of sin in their life. This is when you commit sin unknowingly. Uh, that means that there is a pattern in your life that you cannot control because it either came through your bloodline or there is a demonic influence on your life. So we need to be able to learn what are our specific sins that come from generation to generation or we understand what are the patterns of that sin in our life. And then the fourth, to review, we also said last time that there are family spirits and curses, especially uh, cultures that practice blood sacrifice, any kind of blood sacrifice, like killing a pig, killing chickens, uh, so forth, and so on, head hunting, that's a blood sacrifice, okay? And when there is a blood sacrifice, then it is usually followed by a curse or the action of evil spirits in the bloodline, okay? Well, anyway, let's start with a new lesson today. We need to take into consideration the judgments and the vows and the attitudes of the heart. You need to get to know what are the judgments and vows and the attitudes of the heart when you are dealing with a client or a patient or a member if you are a pastor. You have to understand, we have to understand that the heart is evil from youth. Meaning that when he begins to understand what is life, then the heart is full of evil at that time. That is part of iniquity. Okay, in Genesis chapter 8 verse 21, the heart is evil from youth. Okay, number two, we need to guard our heart with diligence. For out of it comes the issues of life. Maybe you can change the word, say problems of life. Or the struggles of life. They come out of the issues of life okay the iniquity that's in your life it comes out from there it does not come from other other things or other places it usually comes from what is in your heart so in proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 the lord says god says in his word we must guard our heart how do we guard our heart? 
The first is through praise and worship. You are what you worship. So if you worship a monkey, that's your character. You begin to act like a monkey because you worship a monkey. If you worship an idol, you will become like the idol because uh, worship creates something in you and makes you who you are because of what or who or where you worship. So that we must guard our hearts with praise and worship to the proper Lord and Savior. We have only one Lord and Savior. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. To Him we praise. To Him we worship. So that we can become like Him. If you are a Christian and you claim to be a Christian, then you must be, you must act, your character must try to follow Christ, which is who is the head of our house. Okay, what else can we guard our life with? We can guard our lives with the Word of God, the Bible, this one. We must be able to read and memorize, remember scriptures and the Word of God because it guards our heart from being overwhelmed with all kinds of sin. Okay, maybe the third that we can use to guard our hearts is surround ourselves with things about God. You know, if you surround yourself with godly things, then eventually your spirit will follow the godly things. If you follow, surround yourself with sinful things, then eventually your spirit will follow the sinful things. Okay, those are three tips that you, you can have so that you know how to guard your heart as Proverbs chapter 4.23 says, so that the issues of life will be able, you will be able to handle. Okay, number three, we must judge, we all judge rather than discern. Meaning, when you look at things, you must refrain from judging. Or what is judging? Coming to a conclusion about something. Rather, we should discern. Discerning means you look at things as God's Spirit looks at them. How does God look at that person? If you are looking at your father or you are looking at your brother or you are looking at your seatmate or you are looking at your neighbor, the way to discern is to ask, how does God see him? How does God look at my neighbor? How does God look at my father? That is what we call discerning by the Holy Spirit. Do not judge because you cannot judge a book by its cover, as we say. Okay? So, uh, uh, many times Satan will tempt us to judge others by what we see or what we hear, or what we taste or smell, okay? But we need to discern, if you, especially if you're a counselor, you need to discern a person and not judge a person. Or discerning means you are seeing things as God's Spirit looks at that person. Then number four, let us remember that we reap what we judge. If we come to a conclusion of somebody or something or a situation, then the judgment that we make upon them, we will reap the judgment that we have passed upon them. 
Okay, if we say that he is a sinner, but he is not, then we will reap what we have sowed, and it will come back to us. Okay, well, how will it come back to us? Others will judge us like we have judged others. That's why it says in the word of God, judge not that ye be not judged. Okay, so that's how we reap our judgments. Okay, now let's go to the next. The transgression of spiritual laws through need fulfillment. One of the strongest uh, desires in life is to fulfill your needs. Now remember, you have physical needs, you have mental or emotional needs, and you have spiritual needs. Okay. When you have needs, the tendency is you want to fulfill those needs. A child who has never had love in his life needs love. He may recognize it or not. But many times, he will express the need for love by looking for love. Okay. So we need to fulfill our needs by following spiritual laws, the laws of God. Okay. So remember, as I said a while ago, you have physical needs, body needs. You have emotional or, or mental needs, and then you have spiritual needs. The spiritual needs are, uh, are easy to fulfill, but hard to find. Okay. And the only way that your spiritual needs can be met is to go to the Lord Jesus Christ. You can go to Him by prayer. You can go to Him by listening to the Word of God. You can go to Him by going to church, by fellowshipping. That is why we need to worship God together. Because when the presence of God will come into your life, it fulfills a need. Every normal person needs to worship. Uh, every person that calls himself an atheist, he does not believe in God, don't believe him. Because deep down in his heart, actually, he is looking for something to worship. That is the problem today. Because many people have found the wrong thing to worship the wrong person to worship, or the wrong uh, idol to worship, okay? What we really need to do is to find the Lord Jesus Christ and to worship Him in spirit and in truth, okay? Now, all of us attempt to get our needs met outside of the law. Because it is the easiest. In fact, Satan will put in front of all of us uh, fulfillment of our needs the easy way. Because it is quite difficult if you still do not know the, uh, the word of God, it is difficult to fulfill the law of God. Unless you have the spirit of God to help you in your heart. Okay, two main things that will, that will uh, push you to fulfill your needs outside of the Word of God is, number one, your ignorance. You do not know the Word of God. You do not know the Spirit of God. Or the other thing that will push you to uh, have your needs met outside of the word of God is rebellion. If you are rebelling against God or 
you are rebelling against the Spirit of God. What happens is that you will look for ways to fulfill your needs outside of the Word of God. So when you are doing counseling, uh, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you, if you are a counselor, to reveal to you the needs that are being met the wrong way. And there are many ways that it is being done. But simply brought down to the fact that you are violating the laws of God if you meet your need not according to the Word of God. Okay. As a counselor, you need to understand that the needs and the expectation of the needs are almost the same and they're most powerful in every individual. Every person have needs and expectations that want to be fulfilled. Okay, so when you are doing a counseling session, immediately what will come out will be needs. The person will tell you all his needs, starting from physical, then the emotional, and maybe later on the spiritual needs. Okay, and then uh, you will have to deal with what did he expect. Like in marriage, marriage is a difficult uh, uh, subject because in marriage you are trying to fulfill the needs of two persons, the man and the woman. So before they get married, they have expectation. They expect. They expect that living together will be like heaven. <laughs> they expect that it will be a bed of roses. And all of a sudden, they wake up to the fact, in the first year of marriage, they wake up to the fact that, ay, an gaim nga paiso. <laughs> they will come to realize nga, marriage is not a bed of roses. There will be many problems. Now, how they will deal with their expectation is uh, paramount to how our needs are fulfilled. Now, example in marriage, uh, the man expects the girl, the woman to be an angel. But when they get married, sooner or later, they will find out that the uh, lady is a, uh, what, demon, <laughs> demonita. The expectation is not being met. The man does not uh, accept the fact that there are weaknesses in his wife. So there are many kinds of reaction. For example, he can reject the wife. That is the main reason that um, there is divorce or separation is because the expectations are not being met. Okay, or it can be vice versa. The lady finds that the man is not meeting her expectations. Maybe she expects the man to be holy or to be like her father. When does that does not happen, she begins to reject. That is the problem in separation because separation is not sudden. It starts with being rejected. That's when true love comes in. Uh, even when expectations are not met, if there is true love, if the father really loves the son, if the wife really loves the husband, if the husband really loves the wife, if there is really divine love in the relationships, then the Holy Spirit comes in. 
then the Holy Spirit begins to help that person to um, mo, uh, mitigate, we call it in English, uh, mitigate the circumstances where we reject our relationship with our mother or we reject the relationship with our father. Okay. The third thing that we can learn is that spirituals Spiritual laws are at work when we ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Even as a counselor in biblical counseling, if we ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, help us, the Holy Spirit will help us if we let Him. Because many times we ask the Holy Spirit to help us, but we do not allow Him to do the work. We try to implement what we know, or we try to implement what we expect. But that is not biblical counseling. In biblical counseling, we ask the Holy Spirit to implement what is in the Word of God. Okay, now uh, letter D. Yeah, one more time. Now, letter D, a wounded spirit. Uh, this is what happens in all kinds of relationship. In a friendly relationship, in a husband and wife relationship, in a father and daughter relationship, all kinds of relationship. Uh, the thing to avoid and in, in relationships is having a wounded spirit. Okay. Wounded spirit. We are in the origins of stronghold. Project. Sorry. Okay, what, are, what is a wounded spirit? The Word of God tells us a wounded spirit who can bear. A wounded spirit is a condition of the heart that is uh, hardly able to heal. You cannot heal a wounded spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can heal. Okay. So when there is a wounded spirit in a person, he will always respond or she will always respond to a wounded spirit. Okay. Why is there a wounded spirit? There are wounds and rejections of life that deeply affect our inner being. Wounds are caused by actions or words of people that we love the most. You cannot be hurt by a distant relative, but you can be hurt by a relative that is your uh, comrade, your seatmate, your best friend. These are the people that can wound your spirit. Okay. Uh, when people go through life with a wounded spirit, that, and it is not healed, uh, very quickly they are, uh, they are led into temptation. They are led into a sinful nature. Okay, so immediately we need to deal with wounds or rejections in our life so that we can cope with our life. Okay, now uh, a wounded spirit are caused by painful memories. 
okay and painful memories are often attached to unforgiveness when there is unforgiveness then you can be sure behind the unforgiveness are a wounded spirit and there are old and painful memories that cause the wounded spirit that cause the uh, rejection in your life okay uh, wounded spirits begin when you are a child it begins when you begin to remember the things that happen in your life okay and so that when there are painful me memories in your life the secret of overcoming painful memories is to give these memories give it to god let god and the holy spirit deal with painful memories in your life and that will start with forgiving forgiving those that hurt you the most forgiving people that cause you hurt forgiving your parents that may have caused you wounded spirit if you are on an orphan like me you will have to forgive your parents you will have to say i forgive you i understand why you let us go to an orphanage or why you you have not taken care of us because you know when you are young you begin to have questions just like me when i was young i i could not accept that god really loved me because i had question i would question is it true that God loves me if I'm an orphan? If God really loves me, will he cause me to be an orphan, to be an abandoned child? So those are things that, uh, that causes a painful memory. But I want to thank God because uh, when uh, I gave my heart to God, I gave him all the painful memories in my heart and praise God the Holy Spirit uh, did the healing in my heart now I can remember my past but it's not painful that is how healing gets done in your heart and in your spirit when you can remember but it does not become painful anymore when that happens happens number one it means you have asked forgiveness you have recognized and you have accepted your weakness okay now when you have asked forgiveness you have also received forgiveness that is when your painful memories are healed because you have accepted the forgiveness okay now let's go to number three the sins of others against us need healing um, there are sins of others that we forget easily forget why it does not hurt us but when there are things that are done to us and it becomes hurtful it makes us cry it makes us rebel it makes us uh, go away from god we must be able to forgive even if they do not want to be forgiven <laughs> sometimes people that wrong you or do you wrong they do not want to be forgiven they might even try to repeat those things again and again but you must let god help you to forgive all those that have sinned against you that's in the lord's prayer lord forgive me as i have forgiven others as jesus taught his disciples how to pray 
So, in order for God to forgive you of your sin, you have to forgive others. That is why sometimes many people do not receive forgiveness because they are unwilling to forgive others. Okay, so you need to, in healing, you need to forgive others first. Okay, that's even more difficult in a marriage situation. In marriage counseling, one part or one, one the husband or maybe the wife, they do not want to forgi forgive. That's why there is separation. That is why there is divorce. They are unable to forget and forgive. Because in forgiveness, they forget the other part of forgiveness. Actually, in forgiveness, you need to forget. But if you do not forget, you are not being uh, giving forgiveness. Do not say that you forgave somebody if you can still remember and it is hurtful to you. But if you have really forgiven a person, you need to forgive and forget at the same time. Okay, and when you forget at the same time, it does not mean erasing the memory from your mind. What it means is that you let God take care of the offender and you let God take care of the offense. Sometimes you forgive the offender, but you do not forgive the offense or vice versa. And that will cause... Uh, uh, healing, you need an inner healing in your heart in order to advance. Many people in our churches, maybe two-thirds <laughs> of our members, are wounded people. That's why they come to church. So if you're a pastor listening to me or a pastora, you need to understand that more than half of your members have come to church because they have a wounded spirit. They're looking for healing. And you, as a pastor, you must be a biblical counselor in order to help heal the wounded spirit. Okay, and number four, we need to forgive our own sin against ourselves. This is one of the hardest sins to forgive, forgiving yourself, especially when you make a mistake. You know what Satan will do many times to a pastor or even to a Christian? He will bring back old memories to your life. He will bring back old memories to your heart. And you will remember a mistake that you did 20 years ago or 40 years ago. And if it is still painful, it means it has not healed. It also means you have not forgiven yourself. So even if you ask God to forgive others, you must ask God to help you forgive yourself. Praise God. God is a God of our present and our future. He is not the God of our past. Who owns your past? Satan owns your past. Not God. Why? Because God, when he forgave you, he covered your past with his precious blood. Praise God. So that your past, all your mistakes... All of your sin in the past, it's covered by the blood of Jesus. Now, if you don't believe that, uh, it will cause a lot of hurt in your spiritual life. And then even in your mental, uh, emotional life, it's hurt. Because there are things that you don't forget and you don't forgive. But, if God help you, the Holy Spirit will help you to forgive and forget, then even if Satan will remind you of your past, 
you can tell Satan, get behind me, you. <laughs> God has covered my past with his precious blood. Amen. And that is what we call deliverance. You know, many people claim to be an expert in uh, deliverance. But deliverance is when God releases you from your past. That is true deliverance. It's not when the demon will stop tormenting you. It is when you are released from your past because of the work of the Holy Spirit. The blood of Jesus covered you from your past. Okay. Let us look at the uh, family roles and patterns. Uh, God uh, established the family. That is the first uh, institution that God established, the family. Okay. Now, some others will say that it is marriage. It may be. But to me, it is the family that God established. He started with Adam and Eve, and then he, he gave Adam and Eve two sons. And then later, the third, which is Seth. Okay. And how our parents relate to each other in front of us will greatly and deeply affect our inner attitudes about everything about god about marriage about family about government it all comes from watching the little child will watch you that is why i always tell parents be careful what you do in front of children if you have to fight do not fight in front of your children fight in your bedroom if you like but if you will keep this rule then you become a good example as parents but if you are watching your father and mother fight injure each other hurt each other say bad things against each other then uh, you're really in a very bad situation what is worse is when one parent will ask you to side with them. And, you know, many times that's what happens in a family. One parent will ask uh, their children to side with them. Kita niyo tinarami ni Amayo. Kita niyo tinarami ti Inayo. And what you are doing is you are trying to create sides in your family. When that happens, uh, the attitudes that are formed in a child are very strong and very deep and very hard to cure. And you, the child will remember that what he sees when he was five years old with his father and mother fighting, he will remember it the rest of his life unless God sends the Holy Spirit to cover that kind of a problem with the power of the blood of Jesus. Okay. Now, number two in family roles and patterns is what we call imprinting in psychology, child psychology. Imprinting. The child wants to look like you. That's why, that's what we call imprinting. What he sees what he hears, what he smells, what he tastes, what he feels is imprinted in his mind and in his spirit. Uh, that's why Sunday school is very important. We need to imprint in the lives of our children not only what she sees or he hears or he smells or he tastes or what he feels, but what the, we can teach them about God from the Word of God. Okay. So remember that when there is uh, action in front of children, it is immediately imprinted in their lives. 
they may not show it now when they are small. But when they are big, it will come out. And that is very important. That's why in a family, there should be a father, a mother. May met no adati lulu, lula. They will all do an imprinting upon the heart of a baby or a child. And it will carry them throughout their life. And then number three is bonding. Bonding is uh, uh, getting together. Okay. We need to watch what our children are bonding to. I will repeat. We need to watch what our children are bonding to. It's the same in adults. Adults need to be watchful, to be careful. Who are you attaching yourself to? Okay. If you are a Christian, you need to band with others that are Christians also. That is where the word of God comes in. Be ye unequally yoked. That talks about bonding. Okay? We do not understand bonding unless we come back to that scripture. The scripture advises us. The word of God tells us, let us not be yoked or bonded together with people that are of not of the same heart, the same mind, and most especially the same spirit. Okay? Now, be careful if you are a Christian. I'm not saying you should not uh, mingle with sinners. No. What I'm saying is when you are bonding, especially in your spirit, so that even here, uh, here at Bethesda Children's Home, when I see children bonding with each other, it will tell me immediately what, is in the heart of the child. If he bonds with a person that is foolish, there's a tendency that without the healing of God upon his life, he will be foolish because he bonds with other people that are foolish. Okay. And then for number four, we need to have good biblical role models a pastor must be a good role model a biblical counselor if you are really a good biblical counselor you will become a role model to your counselee to your members or to your children you must be a good role model we need christian uh, counselors we need christian role models in our families in our churches even in our society okay now the other thing that affects iniquity is parental discipline discipline of parents uh, we need to understand how or know how our parents will discipline us because it is what develops our inner attitudes of our heart. Or in other words, that's where iniquity steps from. Discipline, parental discipline. Okay, so when there is so-called discipline, parental discipline, we need to ask, is, uh, is it discipline or is it punishment? Okay. Discipline is when you correct children. You correct your wife or husband. You correct your uh, daughter or son. And we ne you need to ask, Am I correcting with love or am I correcting with 
angry and anger in my heart. That's why, you know, here at Bethesda, I usually take my time before I punish children. I do not punish when I am angry. And it took me a while, but uh, I was able to teach my life not, in, not to punish children when I'm angry. Because when you're angry as a mother or as a father, what happens is you are punishing the child. It will affect your weeping. For example, no, you, you want to discipline your child by you know, spanking or uh, doing a uh, punishment. Well, if you do it immediately after the punishment, after the offense, many times it is accompanied by anger, your anger. And then it becomes a punishment. It's not discipline anymore. So, uh, I suggest if you are going to discipline, number one, take a deep breath first. <laughs> okay, sometimes you need to sit down first. You need to think first. And, uh, and the tendency of uh giving a punishment right after an offense is anger you have anger and it does not become discipline anymore it becomes punishment okay number two uh, you need to listen to reason you need to re listen to a child you know when you punish a child you need to listen first even if the side of the child is wrong but you need to listen because that way it will create a bond it will create a, a mutual bond between you and the child because you are listening what affects one child will not affect another what is painful to one child is not painful to the other that is why you have to listen because sometimes what happened to the child is very painful to him, although to others it's not uh, painful or it does not uh, affect them. And so you have to listen. Okay? Even if you will punish, you will have to listen. This is not uh, child psychology, but anyway, I just had to include that. Okay, so when you there is parental discipline, you will have to ask, was the will curbed or controlled? So when you punish, it is supposed to, you know, curb or uh, control the will of a child. So... You know, sometimes you do not need to punish. You just need to talk to a child. So that, uh, but it's very important that as a child will grow, his will has to be controlled. Not your will, but mine. But yours be done, you ask God. Likewise with a child. Not his will, but God's will be done. Okay? Now, when a child's will cannot be curbed or a child's will is, uh, is uh, taking over the attitude of the child and you cannot control him, what will happen is the child will turn out to be rebellious. Not his fault. It was the fault of the parents or the caregivers. They did not curb or control the will of the child so that the punishment or discipline of a child for example it should be toward curbing the will of the child it's the same with a, an adult for example god will punish us so that our will will be controlled that is why uh, sometimes God does not answer your prayers. He is trying to control your will. Because you have a will. 
your will is stronger than the will of God. So, uh, the, the thing that is important here, we must always submit our will to the will of God. And I suggest that a parent will show his child this attitude. When the child will see that the uh, father or the mother is bowing to the will of God, he will also follow later on in his life. Okay. And the last thing that you need to ask about parental discipline, you need to discern, you need to understand, was the spirit wounded? Did your discipline wound his spirit? Now, uh, that's hard to accomplish, especially with children. But you need to be sensitive when you discipline. Do not hurt the spirit of the child. You know, you can always notice when the child's uh, spirit is wounded. Han nga sumardang sangit. He will not stop crying. Even into the night, he cries. Why? His spirit was wounded. Now, when you realize that the spirit of the child is wounded, you, I suggest you better ask forgiveness to the child. Anak, sorry, ah, but you did something wrong, but I had to punish you. You need to do the explanation. Do not just punish or discipline. But if you notice that the, the spirit is wounded, you have to sit down and you have to uh, rationalize or reason out with the child. Maybe put your arm around the child or something like that. You don't, sometimes you don't need to say anything. You just need to put your hand on the shoulder and your child will understand. You know, when we had to send home one boy, I I knew that he was hurt. He did not expect that he would be sent home. But his uh, conduct here was getting to be unruly. So when we prayed for him, I put my arm around his waist and, you know, showed him that everything is forgiven and the past is forgiven. And he can go home with a heart that is uh, forgiven. And that is the attitude that we should take in parental discipline. Okay, last, and we will talk about the others later. I'm sorry we took a whole hour, but this is very important. The last is demonic activity. Okay. The demo, demons or the devil uses all of these areas of weakness. If there is a weakness in our lives, we do not have good parental discipline or we do not have good family roles and patterns or we have a wounded spirit or spiritual loss are transgressed by our need fulfillment or we have judgment and vows and attitudes of our heart, these are all uh, footholds of Satan, meaning they are spaces in our spirit which Satan can take hold of and use against us and against God. Okay, so when there are things like this in our life, Satan will use them as a foothold. Okay. This is when you need deliverance by the help of the Holy Spirit. We need to understand and practice deliverance from fear, deliverance from uh, wounded spirits, deliverance from wrong imprinting, wrong bonding. Okay. And then we need to uh, separate ourselves from any occult. Occult means uh, spirit worship or worshiping other spirits or idols. That is what we call an occult. Okay. 
And here in the Philippines, uh, we are Igorots and all Igorot tribes are guilty of worshipping spirits. So we need to be delivered from the worship of spirits. And then uh, we need to be cured of family, spirits, and curses. Okay. You know, the spirit that moves from one generation to another, we must be delivered. We must ask God to help us to be delivered from this kind of spirits and curses. You know, curses are said many times in a family by uh, parents or by priests. And these curses move from one generation to the other because they are not delivered. The family is not delivered from these curses. So if uh, we recognize that uh, Satan has taken a hold on the family and the curse is moving from one generation to another, we need to exercise uh, deliverance from demonic activity, like for example, suicide, or for example, uh, uh, incest, or for example, other demonic activities that move from one generation to another, then we must have a deliverance from the foothold of the enemy that has been established in our generations. I will talk more about this the next time I will lecture, especially with the family spirits and curses. But I want to thank you for listening and uh, learning how to counsel biblically, how to heal wounds and spirits with the word of God. May God bless all of you.